Chapter 11. Euler's Number So far, we have discovered that the simplest constructible theory of balanced arrangements, based on the minimal geometry of the hyperbolic figure 8 knot, defines an arena projected under five perpetual actions, time, space, charge, mass, and temperature, with Planck constant boundaries. The external charge and mass boundaries of that balance partition into the exact charge and mass values that define the fundamental particles of matter. And every intersection maintained by this minimal balance of boundaries defines a constant of nature. In other words, the partition parameters of the simplest possible self-balanced geometry precisely define the constructive parameters of physical reality, of quantum field theory, and general relativity. In this chapter, we notice that the geometry of this theory of everything has a duly hyperbolic union, one that hyperbolically connects and hyperbolically partitions. That is, the union of the hyperbolic figure eight knot's bounded actions, the Planck union, defined as the sum of the hyperbolic figure eight knot's partitions, divided by the product of its rotations, is equal to the binomial factorized union of the ideal hyperbolic connection represented by Euler's number E, and the ideal hyperbolic partitioning represented by the gamma function. This is a union between the ideal hyperbolic balance and ideal hyperbolic factorization or partitioning. In this arrangement, the only thing left to stipulate was the argument of the gamma function, and that argument will be the full derangements of the system divided by the break and scale symmetry and the condition of split symmetry. Now this split symmetry condition is represented by the geometric constant called the mean line between square edges length in hypercube line picking. And it's defined here geometrically in its hyperbolic sense. Therefore, the Planck union, if you take all the boundaries, all Planck boundaries and mesh the action together at once, you end up getting the hyperbolic connection and the hyperbolic partition. It's a really beautiful, really beautiful setup here. Let's learn a little more about the ideal hyperbolic connection and then the ideal hyperbolic partitioning. So first E and then the gamma function. Euler's number E, which is equal to 2.718281828459049, on and on and on, defines the ideal hyperbolic connection because one, it defines the base of the hyperbolic logarithm, commonly known as the natural logarithm. Two, its factorization is ideally harmonic and invertible. And three, it is the number that hyperbolically generalizes. In other words, E is equal to the infinite sum of inverse factorizations. It's 1 over 0 factorial plus 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial plus 1 over 3 factorial plus 1 over 4 factorial, and on and on and on. Its multiplicative inverse, so 1 over E, is given to us by alternating this infinite sum. 1 over 0 factorial minus 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial minus 1 over 3 factorial plus 1 over 4 factorial minus, and so on and so on. Absolutely delightful. This ideal factorization infinite sequence and its inverse comes just from the sequencing being alternated. Furthermore, if we take this ideal factorization sequence defining E, and we generalize it, so take e to the x. Now the sequence is x to the 0 over 0 factorial plus x to the 1 over 1 factorial plus x to the 2 over 2 factorial plus x to the 3 over 3 factorial and so on. By generalizing this base exponentiation to any factor and splitting that generalization into its even and odd parts, here I've colored blue and red to split them into even and odd parts, we get the hyperbolic identities. Take all the blue parts, put them together in one sum, take all the red parts, put them together in another sum, and those sums then define the hyperbolic identities, the hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine. Remember, the hyperbolic cosine is the average of the exponential function and the inverse exponential function. So let's do that pictorially. The exponential function here in red 
and the inverse exponential function in blue. The hyperbolic cosine function is in green, and it always exists right in between the red and blue curve. Its values are always right between. Another beautiful thing to remember about hyperbolic geometry is that the square of the hyperbolic sine has a golden ratio intersection with the hyperbolic cosine. Same exponential red function and inverse exponential blue function, and the same hyperbolic cosine in green on this graph. Now we added in black the hyperbolic sine squared. The hyperbolic sine squared and the hyperbolic cosine have an intersection. The y value at that intersection is the golden ratio. Now that we've seen how Euler's number E defines the ideal hyperbolic connection, let's take a look at the function defining how the terminal part of this balance ideally hyperbolically factors, the gamma function. Chapter 12, the gamma function. In this chapter, we make the delightful discovery that the gamma function, the elementary factorization function, maps the partition balance of the hyperbolic figure eight knot. Here's the graph of the gamma function with complex argument. Okay, you can just type that into Wolfram Alpha and then zoom in, zoom out to get more familiar with what it's representing. By symmetry, any successful theory of derangements would have to be a successful theory of factorizations, because the definition of derangements and factorizations are connected. So if you can tell a story, if you finally get a complete story of derangements, then that story must be translatable in terms of factorizations or factorials. Therefore, the theory of everything that we just laid out in terms of hyperbolically balanced derangements must also be simultaneously frameable in terms of hyperbolic factorizations, bringing us to the function many luminaries have declared to be the most beautiful function of all. The gamma function is the unique analytic continuation of the factorial function. This means that instead of being defined only at positive integer values, like the primitive factorial function, the gamma function is defined everywhere except for its simple poles at s equals 0 and negative 1 and negative 2 and negative 3 and so on. The integral definition of the gamma function, where the s is equal to the complex number x plus i, y, is just integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 over e to the x dx. In short, the gamma function is the complete factorization or partition function. Let's explore some of its known properties. The gamma function has no zeros. That is, there is no complex number s for which the gamma of s is equal to zero. Therefore, the reciprocal gamma function, one over gamma of s, is an entire function with zeros at s equals zero, negative one, negative two, negative three, and so on. The gamma function hyperbolically generalizes and it has a special point, a local minimum we call x min. We're going to label that special point and keep track of it from now on, but also we're going to keep track of its gamma value. So we put that special point, the minimum value in the gamma function, and keep track of what the gamma function's value is at that point too. So we have two special values that we care about now because we care about the gamma function, but also the gamma function hyperbolically generalizes. A generalized complex argument with real parts 0, 1 half, or 1 have different hyperbolic expressions, but there's a generalized expression for each. We have an x in the imaginary component and an x in each of the returns. The gamma function is also the natural tool for calculating the volume or area of an n-dimensional hypersphere, the arc length of a Lemniscate, skate, and the arc lengths of ellipses, which are given by elliptic integrals simply evaluated in terms of the gamma function, where the incomplete gamma function is equal to the elliptic integral, and that's equal to the difference between the hyperbolic sine integral and the hyperbolic cosine integral. Algebraically, the gamma function is also the unique function that simultaneously satisfies the following three conditions for all complex numbers. If one's the input, one is the output. If s plus one is the input, then the output is s times gamma s. 
And if you take those two, if you take gamma of s plus 1 and divide it by gamma of 1, and then turn both of the ones into n's, and add an n to the s in the denominator, this limiting construction has a relationship with 1 also. As this goes to infinity, this arrangement becomes 1 also. So these are the three algebraic constructive balances that are defining the gamma function at the same time. Perhaps the most beautiful way to look at the gamma function is to look at how it naturally splits up into two regularized two-dimensional parts, the q of a and s and p of a and s, defined by the following beautiful symmetries. The two parts added together equal 1. If you take the derivatives of each of those parts, those derivatives will be exactly opposites of each other, just in sign. They're equal, but opposite in sign. Therefore, if you add the derivatives together, they're equal to zero. These elementary splittings are absolutely beautiful, and to start peering into the beauty that's captured in this, we note that the unitary generalized values of these q and p regularized gamma functions are equal to the generalized inverse exponentiation function, e to the negative x and its geometric reflection, 1 minus e to the negative x. Absolutely beautiful. In other words, the gamma function internally pulls apart into pieces whose unitary generalized actions define the inverse and reflected inverse actions of the hyperbolic functions. Its parts constructively generalize in opposition and reflected opposition to the hyperbolic base, Euler's number e. To unveil the dynamic geometry making use of these ideal hyperbolic factorizations, we set the arguments of the q regularized gamma function to the rotations of the time and space boundaries. And then we examine its output. We just literally go Wolfram Alpha. What's the Q regularized gamma function value if we put the first argument at the rotation of the time boundary and the second argument at the rotation of the space boundary? It just spits out a number. And we remember this number has to be made sense of using the hyperbolic figure eight knots binomial prescription. So we examine its output in terms of the hyperbolic figure eight knots universal binomial prescription and find that the Q regularized gamma function defines a domain under simple division of the minimum three manifold, the Giesking constant, terminally maintaining a three-dimensional hypersphere connection that is structured over a double cover lattice of that minimum manifold. What a beautiful, beautiful equation here. This equation alone is a reason to fall in love with algebra and geometry. To get the other orthogonal half of the story, we set the arguments of the p-regularized gamma function to the same time and space rotations, which, under universal binomial construction, defines the internal and external arrangement of the hyperbolic figure eight knots partition parameters. The gamma function can now be geometrically defined in terms of its balance of internal and external rotations or factors, meaning we're going to get a more complete rich encoding from the gamma function here because we understand the rotations that the partitions are based on. That is, when the arguments of the q and p regularized gamma functions are set to the two internal rotations of the hyperbolic figure eight knot, so rotation zero, rotation one, and they're joined under ideal bifurcation, square square root arrangement, right? So we assumed internally that everything was ideally hyperbolically arranged, so sticking with that. Then externally, they have to express themselves, or they're equal to, the gamma function, set to the fourth rotation of the hyperbolic figure eight knot, divided by its second and third rotations. So the fourth domain is being divided up by the second and third in simple gamma arrangement. Using the binomial factorization prescription, we ask, what's the bounding geometry of the gamma function's action? We find out that the terminal geometry of this arrangement defines the minimum non-compact three manifold, persisting as a projected balance of five rotations maintained over triple doubly periodic factorization, characterized by the Weierstrass constant. It's hard to express the amount of symmetry and amount of potential captured from this one single equation. The gamma function elegantly defines the partition balance of time, 
space, charge, mass, and temperature in one single trivial geometric factorization balance. The most beautiful function of all characterizes how the boundaries of constructive reality, the Planck boundaries, are maintained under ideal hyperbolic factorization. This single equation reveals the five boundaries of physical reality as the unique cyclic expressions of the minimal geometric form. It defines reality's algebraic structure in terms of the simplest three-manifold, giving us rich intuitive access to the internal constructive balance of existence. Before we explore how to use this new functional insight to discover reality's beautiful intricacies, let's examine the inversion synchronicity between the decomposed balance of the hyperbolic figure eight knot and the gamma function. By breaking the gamma function up into its parts, graphing those parts, and comparing them to our previous graphs of the internal actions of the hyperbolic figure eight knot. First, we notice that under unitary and inverse complex argument, the Q regularized gamma function, graph 12, is the inverse graph of the internal action of balance 1, graph 3, except for some small detail around the point 0, 0. Zooming in on that detail around 0, 0, we find a reproduction of the internal action of balance 2, dubbed the partition butterfly. Zooming out on the same graph, we see that under unitary and complex argument, the Q regularized gamma function reproduces the internal action of balance 2. Under triple unitary complex and inverse complex arguments, the P regularized gamma function maps the self-dual external, real, and internal, imaginary partition space. Note the unit circle in the real factorization map in graph 15. An awareness of the gamma function's central role in the persistent balance of reality, coupled with an awareness of the binomial construction of that balance, suddenly equips us with the ability to ask many new precise questions about reality, and to discover their geometric solutions. For example, we can ask, on what boundaries does the gamma function factor? And what is the geometry of those factorizations? To find the gamma function's trivial factorization boundary, we set the gamma function's argument to the sum of the hyperbolic figure eight knots five rotations. So we add up all five rotations that are maintaining the balance of the simplest universe, and we put that sum of rotations as the gamma function's argument. Then we ask, on what boundary and with what terminal geometric action does this set of factorizations trivially close? So that means become equal to its own complete functional inverse, because we need the whole system to factorize but cancel eventually. We're going to set that to the, just the ideal trivial possible way for it to be its own complete inverse as it reaches out. So it's going to be the integral from zero to infinity of one over the gamma function dx, one over gamma x dx. So now we're asking the gamma function. All right, gamma function, we're going to give you the trivial five rotations. Put those as your argument, and we're going to ask you what's the boundary in which that argument trivially self-closes. Remember, since this universal binomial prescription always allows us to, at first, ignore the right-hand part, expecting to get an answer that's not right out to infinite digits, but it will be right out to seven. So we can ignore the second-hand part of this and just solve first for the primary boundary and find what's the primary boundary of factorization. What is it going to be? Well, we know the sum of the five rotations. We can easily solve for that. And the gamma function's complete inverse is defined here with the Frenz and Robinson constant. Just like before, this equation has two unknowns. And since the terminal boundary of this geometry doesn't come into play until the seventh digit of this action, those two unknowns can be solved in pieces. That is, since our box symbol here representing our terminal boundary, which is literally the Planck length times by the Planck mass divided by the Planck charge squared. 
and that numerically is equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 7. And because of this 10 to the negative 7, we can safely ignore the geometric contribution of the terminal factor. Solve for the primary boundary, and then you put that value in and solve back for the terminal geometric action of the factorized balance. We do this by temporarily setting our terminal action equal to zero and solving for the primary boundary. And when we do this, we get a value for the primary factorization boundary of 2.176364643293253 times 10 to the negative eight, which is out to seven significant digit accuracy equal to the Planck mass value. Fantastic. So the trivial factorization boundary for the gamma function is the Planck mass boundary. Now, what is the terminal geometric action of this factorization? To get this, we set our primary boundary equal to the Planck mass boundary, and then we solve for the terminal action. And when we do this, we find that the, its terminal action divides the full derangements of this geometry by the number of its unique partition rotations and maintains that division under square square root hyperbolic vortex lemniscate balance, determined by the hyperbolic vortex radius constant squared and the square root of the lemniscate constant. From this we conclude that the gamma function's primitive factorization boundary is the Planck mass boundary, and that this boundary is terminally maintained under hyperbolic lemniscate factorization balance. To ask about the geometry of the gamma function's other two external factorization boundaries, the Planck charge and the Planck temperature boundaries, we follow the same procedure for the squared and fourth power of gamma factorizations of the same rotations. That is, we set the boundaries of the squared and fourth powered gamma factorizations equal to the Planck charge and the inverse Planck temperature boundaries. We put in the boundaries and just ask what is the primary action and what's the terminal action. Solving first for the primary, of course, and then the terminal action of each, we conclude that the sum of the unique rotations composing the hyperbolic figure eight knot trivially factor about the Planck mass boundary. The square of those rotations elliptically factor about the Planck charge boundary, and the fourth power of those rotations hyperbolically factor about the inverse Planck temperature boundary. What a beautiful set of geometric factorizations that are collectively closing. The universal binomial factorization prescription is a powerful new tool for waking ourselves up to the always present features of existence we've remained blind to. Under that prescription, every clear question we ask the gamma function makes us aware of a unique geometric feature of persistence, enabling us to see features of reality that have always been there, but remained hidden from our conscious view, like seeing the number of an object's sides was hidden from view before Euler. For example, if we ask, how does the time boundary factor, the universal binomial factorization prescription, tells us that it factors into seven circles, two pi times b, terminally arranged into a split-squared balanced arrangement of the minimum manifold. Look at the geometry of this factorization. And then remember, this is how the time boundary factors. This enriched understanding of the gamma function carries over into the function that sits at the heart of the Riemann hypothesis, the Riemann zeta function. Before we leave the gamma function, I strongly encourage everyone to continue exploring reality's constructive secrets by asking precise questions of the gamma function. Having that prescription is a really, really powerful tool. Everything on the left will be the question asked, and if it's asking the gamma function, if the function in play is the gamma function, then we're asking the gamma function how it factors the external rotations, the fourth divided by the second and third. That was a, a piece of our discussion earlier, so we can ask, what is that piece all by itself? This is literally in investigating the prescriptive structure of reality. Beautiful way to explore the world and a beautiful way to be introduced to new aspects of geometry. 
So I've listed a few questions here, question two and question three, and I have their the solutions listed. It's going to give you practice trying to interpret what they mean. Chapter 13, the Ryman Zeta Function. Since the time of Hilbert, the dream has been to find a natural self-adjoint operator whose spectrum yields the zeros of the Ryman Zeta Function, whose zeros intrinsically relate to the distribution of prime numbers. The Ryman hypothesis, widely regarded the most important unsolved problem in pure mathematics, conjectures that the zeros of the Ryman zeta function occur only at negative even integers and at positive complex values with a real part of one half. The Ryman zeta function is defined as an infinite sum and as an infinite product over the primes. When the real part of this complex number is greater than one, the Ryman zeta function can be represented in terms of the inverse gamma function multiplied by the converging summation or integral form of the gamma function offset by one. In the positive real domain greater than one, the zeta function literally can be defined as the inverse gamma function multiplied by the gamma function Except we change the limits of the integral representation of the gamma function. We change it to real part greater than 1 and also change that minus 0 to minus 1. And that's the zeta function. So it's almost the inverse gamma function multiplied by the gamma function. If we didn't change that 0 to a 1. The first special point, the first non-trivial 0 of this zeta function, is represented with rho 1. And its real part is one half, and its imaginary part has a value of 14.13142514173461 and on and on and on. Then we have the second non-trivial zero and the third non-trivial zero and all the way up the list. There's an infinite set. And to make sense of the Ryman hypothesis, first, of course, we're going to need to make sense of this series and prove that that series all has a real part of one half. Other special known values of the zeta function, zeta of zero is negative one half, but the zeta prime of zero, take the derivative of this, it's negative one half of log of two pi. The zeta of one is infinity, so there's a pull at one. Zeta of two is pi squared over two times three. Zeta of 4 is pi to the 4th over 2 times 5 times 3 squared. And zeta of 6 is pi to the 6th over 2 plus n times by n times by 3 cubed. Graphing the Ryman zeta function under inverse complex argument, we notice that it contains split binding points, maintaining separate junctions about the point 0, 0 and 1, 0. Graph 17. Zooming in on the detail around point zero zero, we get graph 18, and this gives us a reproduction of the internal action of balance 2. And zooming in on the detail around point one zero, graph 19, reproduces the inverse graph of the internal action of balance 1. It has long been known that the key to solving the Ryman hypothesis and unraveling the deep mysteries of the primes lies in finding a self-adjoint operator that is naturally bound by the zeta function zeros. That is, finding a geometric explanation for the Ryman zeta function. Since the trivial zeros are not difficult to see the pattern in, the dream has been to find the geometric reason for why the non-trivial zeros, which all have real part one half, have the values they do. Most importantly, why does the first non-trivial zero of the zeta function, the imaginary part of row one, have the value it has? Using the universal binomial factorization prescription, the imaginary part of row one, the first non-trivial zero of the zeta function, is trivially revealed as the circular hyperbolic factorization boundary that terminally maintains the hyperbolic vortex radius under simple chiral connection. The hyperbolic vortex radius constant is equal to this bound, the imaginary part of the first non-trivial zero of the Ryman zeta function, multiplied by the trivial circular hyperbolic boundary splitting, inverse cosine circular 
hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic, on an argument of 5 over 2, so a splitting of 5 over 2. And terminally, this n over 2 is maintained under simple chiral connection, which we represent with the real projection of the infinite power tower of i, the imaginary root. In other words, the first non-trivial zero of the Riemann zeta function constructively defines the zero bound, or throat, of the hyperbolic vortex. The gamma function and the zeta function are ideal tools for exploring the construction of reality via the universal binomial prescription. Every question these functions answer sharpens our geometric understanding of the partition balance of reality, defining a unique feature of persistence. I strongly encourage everyone to continue exploring the constructive secrets of reality by asking precise questions of the Riemann zeta function and using the universal binomial prescription to find their answers. For example, for a richer understanding of the zeta function, we might ask, question one, what is the zeta function value of the time boundaries rotation? To get this answer, we would just put in the zeta of the value of the time boundaries rotation and hit equals in Wolfram Alpha. We'd get a number, and we'd then, of course, put that number into the universal binomial prescription and find that it is this partition and rotation combination. Question two. What is the zeta function value of the space boundaries rotation? Gives us three times by Rene's parking constant. Rene's parking constant's value is literally determined by the arrangement of e to the negative 2 gamma multiplied by the infinite integral of, from 0 to infinity of e to the negative 2 gamma instead of euler mascheroni gamma, this is the, the gamma function, okay? But this is the incomplete gamma function, 0 comma x, over x squared. And this is the same thing, you can replace the, the gamma function in this with the elliptic integral of negative x. And its terminal parameter is determined completely by the hyperbolic vortex radius squared and the gamma function, the derangements of this system, and the omega-1 constant, the unitary value of the Lambert's W function, which is defined as the unique real number that satisfies the equation omega times e to the omega equals 1. Question 3. What is the zeta function value of the Planck length's inverse square rotation? Question four, what is the zeta value of one over the hyperbolic vortex radius? So if we take a system that's under division of the hyperbolic vortex radius and put that system in the zeta function, what does the zeta function do with that? What does it say it is? Question five, what is the zeta value of square inverse hyperbolic vortex radius division? So instead of just the one over hyperbolic vortex radius, now we're doing the zeta value of 1 over the hyperbolic vortex radius squared. And when we solve for that, our universal binomial factorization prescription gives us the solution involving the Murata constant, which is another constructive product of primes. Chapter 14. Inside. There are exactly four kinds of numbers that can be added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided. That is, there are exactly four division algebras, real numbers, complex numbers, quaternions, and octonions. The real numbers are one-dimensional. Pairs of real numbers make the complex numbers, which are two-dimensional. Likewise, pairs of complex numbers make the quaternions, which are four-dimensional. And pairs of quaternions make the octonions, which are eight-dimensional. And that's the end of the line. That is, the octonions represent the last of the division algebras. No higher-order pairings will allow all those symmetric operations. These division algebras reflect the constructive division balances assigned to the different domains of reality. The external domain connects under real, complex, and quaternion construction, whereas the internal domain rearranges those same parts into octonion construction. Let's take a look here at the Cayley logic table for the octonions. This is meant to be portraying the seven basis vectors and their algebraic connection. In total, 
The octonian logic symmetrically connects eight things, seven basis vectors plus the unitary element, one, and it connects them under closed three-member operations. This means it topologically decomposes into eight simply connected triangles, a three-part connected thing. And since this system decomposes into eight simply connected triangles, and four simply connected triangles makes a tetrahedra, that means this decomposes into two tetrahedra. To visualize what the full octonian connection looks like, to see its eight symmetric triple groupings, we graph the product of the interaction of balance zero and the interaction of balance one. We just multiply those both together, and when we plot them under inverse complex argument, we get this. The real and the complex graphs identify two inner groups of three and two exterior groups of three connecting under five-part asymmetric balance, defining the eight three-member simply connected closed operation of the octonian logic. Chapter 15, Outside. The minimum geometric balance has now been defined in terms of minimal derangements and in terms of hyperbolically balanced factorizations, the gamma function. In the last chapter, we noted that the internal geometry of that minimum volume partitioning is bound under octonian logic. In this chapter, we examine the external geometric expression of this balance, defining the n hypersphere of maximal volume, and note its connective logic. To an internal observer, the universe appears bounded into the shape of the hyperbolic figure eight knot. So if you're inside that volume, the universe is bounded from your point of view in the shape of the hyperbolic figure eight knot. But externally, the constructive parts of those boundaries, the same circles that make up the hyperbolic figure eight knot construction, externally are rearranged into the shape of the n hypersphere of maximal volume. More specifically, they form the internal projective boundary of the n hypersphere of maximal volume. What does the n hypersphere of maximal volume look like? On its grandest scales, the n hypersphere of maximal volume defines the simplest possible geometric form in S3, the great sphere, minus its boundary. On the other end of things, the internal boundary of the n hypersphere of maximal volume defines the second simplest geometric form, the minimal hypersurface known as the Clifford torus. As a helicoidal product surface, the Clifford torus defines the simplest and most symmetric flat embedding of the Cartesian product of two circles. That is, it defines the simplest connection between two circles, each of which possess their own independent two-dimensional embedding space, resulting in a product space that's R4, the four-dimensional hyperbolic space-time of general relativity. But that's not the end of the story. Since this helicoidal surface connects two circles of significantly different size, the chiral connection of its rotation operator is highly asymmetric, causing the Cartesian product of these two circles to twist into an R3 torus. Under asymmetric chiral connection, this is unavoidable. The first circle in that connection consumes x and y, leaving only one independent axis z available to the second circle. This quickly collapses the R4 domain into a R3 projection. A torus embedded in R3 is an asymmetric reduced dimension projection of the maximally symmetric Clifford torus embedded in R4. The equation for the tangent cone of the Clifford torus is x1 times x2 equals x3 times x4. The division parameters of the Clifford torus's tangent cone are the connectors of the hyperbolic figure eight knot's terminal boundary, rotation one, rotation two, and rotation three, the rotations of the Planck length, Planck charge, and Planck mass boundaries are gonna be our dimensional operators defining this constructive form. Note that although this construction is four-dimensional, only three of those dimensions are unique. There's an inherent squaring set in this construction. 
The tangent cone of the Clifford torus defines the projective null cone of hyperbolic geometry. The entire surface of this hypercone defines the division singularities of the external domain. And the balance maintained by this constructive arrangement between the future hypercone and the past hypercone defines the hyperplane of the present, the most trivial minimal hypersurface. The other minimal hypersurfaces embedded in this geometry, those that play a role in the helicoidal collapse from R4 to R3, are found by generalizing the Clifford torus via the method of separation of variables. And for this, I highly recommend watching Jae Young Zhao in his Some Minimal Submanifolds Generalizing the Clifford Torus video. The minimal hypersurfaces are the Clifford Torus, its tangent cone, its hyperplane, the lemnus gate, and the minimum catenary. These are all the minimal hypersurfaces that can be obtained by the method of separation of variables, since this external geometry is maintained under n hypercube connection. Minimally bounded by the Clifford torus, it comes trivially programmed with the rules of differentiation and integration. The rules of calculus define how the external part of this balance connects. Let me say that again. The rules of calculus, differentiation, and integration define how the external part of this balance connects. By definition, the derivative defines how the volume of the n-dimensional hypercube increases or decreases as the side length of that hypercube is changed. On the other hand, integrating this picture, stacking the faces, geometricizes the fundamental theorem of calculus, yielding a decomposition of the n-cube into n-pyramids, which is a geometric proof of Cavalieri's quadrature formula. The structure of calculus is also centrally scripted by the ideal hyperbolic connection, E, whose generalized power series defines the elementary derivative sequence. E to the x is x to the 0 over 0 factorial plus x to the 1 over 1 factorial plus x to the 2 over 2 factorial plus x to the 3 over 3 factorial. Notice that every term in this generalized exponential series defines the derivative of the following term. The simplest possible self-balance naturally defines the division parameters of physics, and the arithmetic of this balance hierarchically maintains all the division algebras under closed asymmetric connection. The internal geometry of this balance defines the minimum possible volume partitioning, the hyperbolic figure eight knot, whereas its external projection defines the n hypersphere of maximal volume. On its largest scales, the n hypersphere of maximal volume defines the simplest possible geometric form in S3, the great sphere minus its boundary. And on its smallest scales, the n hypersphere of maximal volume is internally bounded by the second simplest geometric form, the Clifford torus, which collapses from the R4 domain into the familiar R3 projection of common experience under asymmetric chiral connection. The connective logic of this external projection for everything within the n hypersphere of maximal volume defines the rules of calculus. Chapter 16. Hyperbolized. In this book, we have found that the minimal partitioned volume, the hyperbolic figure eight not complement volume, and the n hypersphere of maximal volume jointly form the minimum partitioned balance. This balance defines an arena maintained under the projection of five perpetual actions with Planck constant boundaries, time, space, charge, mass, and temperature. The external charge and mass boundaries of that balance partition into the exact charge and mass values that define the fundamental particles of matter. And the boundary intersections of this minimal balance define the constants of nature. We also found that this theory of everything constructively maintains a dual hyperbolic union, one that hyperbolically connects and hyperbolically partitions, defined by the gamma function, and 
orthogonally by the Riemann zeta function. The external projection of this geometry defines the n hypersphere of maximal volume, which takes the shape of the great sphere minus its boundary on its maximal scale, and on its smallest scales is internally bounded by the second simplest geometric form, the asymmetric Clifford torus. This n hypersphere of maximal volume trivially maintains the connective logic of calculus. Future editions of this book can be expected to add the following topics to this conversation. There's, of course, many other things to add, but these are the major notes. Primes. Having a minimal derangement or factorization theory means having a formally constructed definition of the rules of the minimum stage. Defining how the minimum projective system at the one fundamentally internally factors. This conceptual framework for what it means to be divisible by one or have unit divisibility puts us in the proper position for addressing the great mysteries of the primes. The set of unique division elements in reality. This story should properly finish by wrapping back to its beginning to the platonic solids and the idea that the universe was somehow composed of them. After all, Plato was hyperbolically right. Reality does have a shape that defines the parameters of its construction. That shape decomposes into five elementary geometric parts. Thurston showed that the inner complement of the hyperbolic figure eight knot decomposes into two regular hyperbolic tetrahedra. This almost begs us to complete the story, to tell the story of how the other elementary partitions relate to the icosahedron, and so on. And of course, that story should really include a rich exploration of these exceptional symmetry groups, E7, E8, all those. So that's going to be a direction I go in the future. Also, it's going to be really important to work on the connection logic. And my think tank and I are going to be really focusing on this. But here's a little hint of the direction intended here. Let me start with a quote by Sir Michael Atea. If you have a closed manifold with a surface in it, then its self-intersection number is the electric charge. The Euler number of the hyperbolic figure eight knots complement division boundary is two since it's isomorphic to a sphere. Its inverse, therefore, is equal to the self-intersection number of a negative two, defined by the sum of the external partition parameters squared, divided by the product of those partitions. And it turns out that this is also equal to the sum of all the fundamental particle charges. If you look at all 18 particle assignments that the hyperbolic figure eight knot divides charge into, add them all together, some of which are zeros, right? But add them all together, you get a total charge of negative two. The next question is, how does this connection logic extend? That is, since we know the full internal division balance of a single minimum universe, how do we define the intersection of two of these minimum balances, or three, and so on? Can we show that the sequences of compact orientable surfaces and compact non-orientable surfaces define the combinatorial sequence of stabilization between G intersecting universes? And of course, the Riemann hypothesis. Now that we have a richer way to talk about the Riemann zeta function, we are in a uniquely favorable position for addressing the Riemann hypothesis. And that's one of the directions I'm going to go in, of course. And I believe most of my team and my think tank is going to be focusing on most of these things with me. I'd like to thank, of course, everybody that's played a role in this process so far. I think this is obviously historical and monumental, an ontological tool to explore the world and conceive mysteries that up until now have been thought in the realm of gods alone, that only the gods would ever understand why the electron has the mass it does, or why it has the charge it does. These were literally until now conceived by nearly everyone I know as at minimum a thousand years beyond us. And I think we have clearly shown that's not the case. The question isn't, can we answer those questions? It's, can we sharpen our questions further from here? Can we take this new perspective, stand on it, and then go further on?